The Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me down to lie in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. We've just heard the words of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the word of God, the word of truth, the word of life. Hear what Jesus says. I know you and I've got you. The people who belong to Jesus are known by him and held by him. Intimacy and security. These words come from a tense moment in Jesus' life. He's engaged in a sharp confrontation between the leaders and rulers of the people, and he's calling them out on their failure to care for the people. The Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. We do so all the time, but we should do so all the more in the midst of this emergency. We can give thanks for our leaders in government, in the health services, in the police, in the public service. They're working tremendously hard and doing their very best to lead us through this crisis. The Prime Minister and the State Premiers and Chief Ministers have formed a national cabinet they're faced with incredibly difficult decisions and you can see on television they're wrestling daily with the responsibility and the impact of what they decide. When Jesus says he is the good shepherd, he is making himself the leader we have to have. He's equating himself with God in the Old Testament. God says he is the shepherd of his people. When Jesus says he's the good shepherd, 
He identifies himself as king of God's people, the heir to the throne of the shepherd King David. And in verse 10, he makes a personal appeal to the people, saying he's come so that they may have life and have it to the full. When Jesus says he's the good shepherd, he's making a theological, political and personal statement, a provocative statement against the leaders and rulers of the people and claiming to be himself God, King and fullness of life. Jesus is the leader we have to have. His leadership is unique, beautiful, powerful and essential. He models leadership, certainly, but more than that, Jesus is the only person who can be trusted to lead our souls. He says he's come to offer us life to the full. He meets our deepest needs of forgiveness, security and identity. And he's the only one to be trusted in the face of what the Bible calls our last enemy, death. I want to talk about two aspects of the fullness of life that Jesus offers in a world of grief and anxiety. Two aspects of the fullness of life that Jesus offers, security and intimacy. Firstly, security. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The primary business of a shepherd is to keep the sheep safe. Jesus is thoroughly committed to the sheep. In the passage we read, the shepherd knows his sheep, leads them, goes ahead of them. Jesus is so committed to the sheep and their security that he will lay down his life for them. And Jesus says, this is not like the hired hand. Verse 12, when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Jesus is referring to the leaders of his day who neglected the people and then condemn them. And Jesus' words are true today too of false and wicked pastors who distort the truth and exploit God's people. But it also applies to the alternative saviors and myriad voices who claim they will provide for us and give us life to the full. Coronavirus has exposed all kinds of false security and empty promises, many of which we choose to believe even though we know they're empty. The marketers of everything from food to cars to clothes, dating agencies and weight loss programs, technocrats and the lifestyle salesmen. It can be hard to think of who is not making promises of peace and security and fullness of life that in reality they cannot deliver. Our inboxes are full of their cancellation notices. The largest part of our scepticism about such claims is that they frequently hide a deep streak of self-interest and self-promotion. But Jesus says he lays down his life. It's sacrificial, selfless service for the sheep. In just a couple of weeks, it'll be Easter. We'll be remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus saves us from the death our sins deserve, saves us from the consequences of our foolishness and rebellion. Jesus' death on the cross defeats our enemy, death. Jesus' death on the cross saves the sheep because it's a death in our place. Verse 11 says, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, meaning in our place and on our behalf. The cross of Christ is a great exchange, the life of the shepherd so that the sheep may go free. God's obedient son dies so that God's rebellious children may live. The death of the one who was without sin laid down so that sinners may be forgiven all for love's sake. It is the will of the Father and the will of the Son. I lay it down of my own accord, Jesus says in verse 18, for the sheep. Security. Jesus' sacrifice secures our peace with God, our life with God now, and our future with God forever. The shock of coronavirus is that with a fr within a frighteningly short period of time, everything we took for granted going to work, sending the kids to school, having a coffee with friends, disappeared. Our sense of security and constancy and control threatened and challenged in a way that we thought was impossible. Jesus says, you'll find security for your soul, peace in the world, hope for the future in me, now and forever. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. The second dimension of the fullness that Jesus offers, intimacy. Jesus provides personal knowledge of God. 
Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus uses an ordinary everyday image, the shepherd calling his sheep out of the sheep pen, to convey something almost unimaginable. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. This is incredibly striking. The shepherd of Israel is the king of Israel. When Jesus says he knows his sheep and his sheep knows him, know him, he means as king and ruler of his people, he knows them. That's not part of our usual experience to be known by our leaders and rulers. The media ensure that we know quite a bit about our political leaders, maybe more than we want, but they don't know us. Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Jesus, the good shepherd, says that the knowledge he has of his sheep and they of him is the same as that close, joyful knowledge and fellowship that he has with the Father. And that is good news. Because human beings long for intimacy. God made us that way to love and to be loved to be related to others deeply and honestly. And so we have within us a tremendous desire to be known by someone for what we are and who we are and still to be loved, to be accepted, to be welcomed, to be known to be less than perfect, and yet to be loved. Such relationships are not impossible, but they are rare, hard to come by, hard to sustain, hard to preserve. But every Christian in life and in death can say, we know in whom we have believed. We know our good shepherd. We know the fullness he's brought into our lives. We know the father as the son knows the father. We know in whom we have believed. In this cultural moment in the Western world, we've taken the biblical idea of the dignity of the human individual and inflated it in a way that is causing us immense difficulty. We are the people who can be what we want to be and do what we want to do, but we're anxious and depressed and self-harming in greater numbers than ever before. The Bible, which teaches the dignity of the individual, also prizes and preserves the idea that our identity is not merely self-created and self-focused, but interdependent with our relationships with others and with God. We are someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, uncle, grandchild, fellow worker, we are ourselves only in relationship with all kinds of other people as we take our place in a family, in a community, for Christians, in the church. The Bible teaches the dignity of the individual but doesn't isolate the individual. And we're living out the wisdom of this as we're forced into social distance and self-isolation. In isolation and separation, we recognise how much we grieve the absence of our loved ones colleagues, friends, and we don't only miss their company, but we miss the person we are when we're with them. It's not only knowing ourselves that makes us who we are, it's being known and knowing others that makes us who we are. Jesus says later in John's Gospel, this is eternal life, to know God and the Son whom he sent. Knowing God is essential from Jesus' point of view for fullness of human life. When Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me, he's offering the intimacy and the identity that we all crave but struggle to find. The security and intimacy that Jesus provides for his sheep flow from the Easter events of his death and resurrection. His death secures us in the face of the judgment on sin that we deserve because he dies in our place. And Jesus Death opens the way for close relationship with the Son and the Father. As Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain in the temple is torn in two and the way is open to forgiveness from God, fellowship with God, life with God now and eternally. We may know God and be known by him because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Australians, I think, have an ambiguous relationship with leaders. We care about leadership. The absence of leadership is not freedom but anarchy. But we're sceptical of leaders and we're never satisfied. We want someone to lead, we're just not much into following. 
When Jesus finished speaking, John tells us his hearers were divided. Some wanted to hear him again, others dismissed him. This pandemic, by God's grace, will pass. When it's over, we'll reflect on its lessons. One of them, surely, will be that the best of human leaders are only human at best. Jesus is the leader we have to have, the good shepherd who knows his sheep and lays down his life so that we may have life to the full. May you know Jesus and the fullness that only he can give. Amen.